thanks so much, Nick, for inviting me to give a talk on dryland soil cyanobacteria for our cyano world audience. My name is Nicole Petrasiak, and I am an assistant professor at New Mexico State University, and I lead the dryland algae lab. And for our international folks that may not be familiar with New Mexico State University and our lab, let me quickly introduce ourselves. We are located in the beautiful Chihuahuan Desert in the state of New Mexico, which is a state found in the desert southwest of North America. And what do we do? Well, as a scientist, my mission is to explore the microscopic world and to speak up for our little microbial friends through enriching our understanding of desert microbiology. So specifically our research goals or objectives in our lab are to understand what shapes the diversity, abundance and distribution of desert microbes with a focus on cyanobacteria. We also link diversity patterns to the roles the microbes play in the ecosystem functioning and soil health. And we characterize and describe unique dryland cyanobacteria that fit no established taxa. My research program is super exciting and very much interdisciplinary. So it involves multiple avenues to be engaged in research. For example, a great portion of our research happens outside. So we are out there collecting samples and really cool places, we characterize the landscape, and we perform ecosystem function measurements. But we also do a lot of lab work using molecular biology approaches, uh, have fun on the microscope, doing light, basic light microscopy or advanced microscopy, and various lab experiments to determine um, biogeochemistry or other ecosystem functions. And as you can see on the pictures, we also are involved in big data processing when we do bioinformatics. So our group has a lot of fun together unraveling the mysteries of dryland microbes and cyanobacteria. But for my talk today, I would like to share some of our adventures and present you a little taste of our research. So let's look at a quick overview of the talk. At first, want to introduce you to a strange habitat that is soil. Then I want to remind us why doing ecological and taxonomic research of soil cyanobacteria and drylands is highly critical. Next, I want to talk about the importance of why the little things matter to dryland ecosystem health. And then I also want to present some of our work in revealing cyanobacterial diversity from dryland soils by demonstrating how dryland soils represent true treasure chests of hidden cyanobacterial diversity, but also at the same time revealing new discoveries in ecology and evolutionary bi biology. And lastly, I will conclude the talk with a synopsis and some of my current and future directions. Okay, let's dig into soil as a habitat. A large portion of you have a great understanding about the diversity in life of our cyanobacteria and aquatic systems. Now, let me take you out of your comfort zone and introduce you to a strange and mysterious habitat that some of our blue-green friends consider a home, soils. Soils offer unique habitats filled with complexity. So often one cubic centimeter of soil is not like the other. Soils are considered critical zones on our planet, interfacing the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and the biosphere, which is reflected in the tight interplay of water, gases, inorganic and organic matter. And with such interfacing, emergent properties can arise that make our soils living entities. And with all that complexity and all those interactions in soils, soils are exceptionally diverse habitats. It turns out that it is in soils that we find the majority of all terrestrial life forms. However, regardless of our estimates of the vast number and kinds of organisms 
that live in soil. We only have limited knowledge of the biological species that live there and what each and every single of them do. And at the same time, we unfortunately still lack the taxonomic expertise or manpower to describe this enormous diversity. And that includes cyanobacterial diversity. And it doesn't help that taxonomy and the systematics research are currently facing a big existential crisis. And this is kind of worrisome because it is the work of a taxonomist that is fundamental to preserving and protecting declining biodiversity. And that requires the study and the recognition of all of our planet's biodiversity, including the microscopic diversity. Because without knowing and assigning an identity to any organisms, we cannot perform effective conservation efforts or make advancement in biosecurity and technology and science in general, right? Unfortunately, despite the critical need for this work, taxonomy and systematic research is trapped in a big downward cascading spiral. I have been talking about this for years, but it seems it only has been getting worse. Let's look at some of the key challenges that we're facing. First, resources for taxon taxonomic research are drastically shrinking and the financial support by granting agencies is dwindling. Consequently, the taxonomic infrastructure is getting dismantled and facilities such as museums and cultural collections are battling fierce competitions for the little bit of funding there is to support them. And what happens then? Well, without enough funding, attracting early career scientists to the field is becoming increasingly difficult. And it's common that it is common that newcomers leave the field when unable to secure funding for a new program. Another point is that taxonomic research rarely makes it into major scientific journals like Nature or Science. So taxonomy is not really considered to be um, amongst the hip sciences. And so naturally, um, natural history is less and less seeked out by students or supported by universities, which further deepens the recruitment challenges. The results are that much of the new shiny next gen mole molecular studies are often disconnected from taxonomic work because taxonomic expertise and training are disappearing. All these challenges create a big bottleneck for biodiversity research, including cyanobacterial diversity and microbial diversity in general. At the same time, the need and urgency for this work increases dramatically in our rapidly changing world. And it turns out that for one biome, this bottleneck in biodiversity research is particularly troublesome, drylands. Drylands are actually one of the most neglected biomes for biodiversity and related taxonomic research in general, although drylands cover an enormous extent of the terrestrial ecosystems, as you can see here in the orange red shading on the map. And if you have not been in the desert Southwest, let me tell you, this expansive space actually contains a phenomenally diverse nature of soils. So it's not really a surprise to a soil ecologist that dryland soils represent treasure chests of hidden cyanobacterial diversity. And it's here that we can discover a fascinating diversity of charismatically beautiful organisms that are so important for dryland ecosystem health. Unfortunately, at the same time, drylands are one of the most threatened biomes resulting from the recent rapid human population increases. And with more people comes a huge demand of land for housing, for infrastructure, energy, and recreation. And that creates severe environmental problems, including, for example, invasions of non-native species, uh, dust emissions, soil degradation, and habitat loss. 
and the list goes on. Every day, we're losing valuable dryland topsoils and we'll continue to degrade it. And that topsoil is the habitat where our beloved soil cyanobacteria like to hang out and thrive. So that kind of means that in this very moment, we're losing biodiversity and resources that we don't even know about. Okay, so drylands are expansive, they're beautiful and they're threatened. But what in particular makes it an interesting habitat for cyanobacteria? Well, if you haven't noticed it yet, drylands have sort of a very unique makeup of the landscape. So if you look at this picture here, you may notice that plant distribution is not continuous. So you have large uh, patches that are open intermixed with patches of vascular plants. And it's actually those open spaces where we can find our beloved blue-green friends. You don't believe me that cyanobacteria can flourish in desert soils, huh? Well, let's review the resources cyanobacteria need to be happy. Well, we need light. Uh, we got a ton of it in the desert, right? So lots of light available. We need also carbon and nitrogen. Well, cyanobacteria can get those from the above and below ground atmosphere. Actually, a soil environment is pretty much enriched in, in CO2, so you don't really run out of those. Mineral nutrients, well, we've got lots there in the inorganic matter of the soil. All it takes is a little bit of a bioweathering, right? And we need water. Well, yes, water is a key and limiting, but it does rain in the desert, and that rain sometimes is enough for cyanobacteria to reactivate and complete their life cycle in short periods of time. So once you understand that we have what it takes for cyanobacteria to make a living and you start open your eyes, you will notice a fascinating microscopic landscape full of unrecognized beauty and wonders as evidenced by these images here. Cool. So hopefully you believe me now that these open patches are not devoid of life, but occupied by our blue-green friends. And it's in these open patches between plants that cyanobacteria create something super cool, biological soil crust. Biological soil crusts or short biocrusts are living soil aggregates. So it's a biological feature at the soil surface. So it's a living soil aggregate in which photosynthetic microbes and associated microbes can live. And it's uh, pretty much just a really thin layer in, in the desert within the first centimeter of the soil surface. Biocrust house highly diverse microbial communities that consolidate the soil and form a crust at the surface. And it's the cyanobacteria that are now recognized as the ecosystem engineers for building this unique surface aggregation. So where can you find biocrusts? Well, they can be found worldwide in all continents, anywhere where water loss exceeds precipitation. So meaning where it's dry and that's most um, common found in arid and semi-arid environments. So our dry places like deserts, the Mediterranean or savannas. And our cyanobacteria that are living in this really thin uh, aggregate, which can be sometimes only millimeters thick, matter a heck of a lot. So let's check out why they're important. So soil cyanobacteria that create biocrust 
represent unique and important ecosystem components in our drylands. So they don't only have incredible ways to survive in dryland soils, but they also provide a number of really important ecosystem services. For example, they supply a nutrient poor system with carbon and nitrogen, right? They bring that in from the atmosphere. And most fascinatingly, they produce um, a uh, what we could call microbial superglue. So they excrete exopolysaccharides that bind uh, the soil to form this biological soil crust. And that can be pretty strong, as you can see here in, in the video on the lower right. right? Those are all cyanobacteria cyanobacteria filaments that hold on to soil grains. That's pretty powerful, right? And some of the cyanobacteria that we find in biocrust are also motile. And that's a critical trait that helps create and expand biocrust. So you can see here um, a beautiful microcoleus that is just cruising through the liquid media here in the microscope. So let me show you a case study, which we're currently working on at White Sands National Park. White Sands is a gypsum dune system made out of gypsum sand and substrates. And here at this national park, we're trying to research the prevalence and importance of biocrust along the leading edge of the dunes or this dune system to understand the contribution of cyanobacteria to stabilizing the mobile sand. And looking at the map here, you can see our 24 research sites that we established. These sites represent eight dune types differing in mobili mobility and age, and age, I mean, geologic age. We have three representative uh, sites for each dune types, which makes it up to 24 sites. And the photos on top show you representative pictures of this dune age gradient. So it's like a dune chrono sequence. And we chose the leading edge uh, of the dune system because that's where the chrono sequence is most pronounced. So we're pretty much dealing with a gradient of very mobile Barkin and parabolic dunes with moving sands here on the left to more and more stable and vegetated dunes on the right. So it sets up a really cool and interesting geomorphic gradient. So we then assess crust abundance with cover and frequency quadrants, which are a standard field biological uh, technique. And we surveyed the dune slopes and the adjacent downslope sand sheath using this methodology. And what we saw along this uh, chrono sequence along this dune gradient was a surprisingly high cover of biocrusted sediment and soils. So here you can see a percent ground cover on the y-axis and the different dune types on the x-axis arranged along the chrono sequence. Orange colors represent the dune slope, blue represent the sand sheet. And you can see that Biological soil crusts ranged from 25 to 80% uh, in cover, which is considerably high in, when, we, when we look at the average, right? So we get cover values that average around 40 to 80% of cover on the land surface. That's incredible. So what that means is that the system can be microbially driven. There was also a difference in cover based on dune age and geomorphology. So it really matters if you establish on the dune slopes versus down slope on the sand sheet. 
So that was kind of cool. What is even cooler is that this biocrass is foundationally built by a matrix of cyanobacteria, as you can see here, contrasting the major crust types that we had with cyanobacteria biocrust, lichen biocrust, and moss crust. And in every single one of them, cyanobacteria are either dominating or can be an important part of the community. And not surprisingly, these cyanobacteria uh, dominated crust and it's like their changes in ground cover was associated with changes in ecosystem functions, such as shown here in the association of soil stability along the dune corona sequence. And what we did here is uh, contrasting soil aggregate stability along the dune corona sequence and linking it to biocrust cover values, which are represented in the circles. So what this graph pretty much shows is that stability of the dunes increases over time. And that stability was mainly attributed to our biocrust cover, not to plants, to biocrust. So to our beloved microbes and especially our cyanobacteria. So what kind of cyanobacteria species can we find in, in our drylands? And what new mysteries to ecology and evolutionary biology can we discover along the way? So what do we know of cyanobacteria diversity in drylands? Let's start with that. So five years ago, there was a meta-analysis done which reported 179 species known to inhabit dryland soils and biocrust. And these species belonged in 44 genera within six of the eight currently recognized orders. And that's an incredible broad phylogenetic diversity. But we kind of think that this estimate may have been at the lower end of the range. Why? Well, most of these species listed were identified using morphological characters only as observed in field samples or cultured isolates. And secondly, a lot of the historical taxa identification were based on European keys that were made from freshwater taxa. So in recent years, the polyphasic approach has become the modern standard of identifying and describing cyanobacterial diversity. And polyphasic means using multiple lines of evidence instead of morphology alone, which to a minimum includes DNA-based information. And the first dryland cyanobacteria uh, genus uh, from soils to be described with a polyphasic approach appeared in 2002. And since then, there has been at least 11 new genera and numerous species described from the Americas alone. So what does this polyphasic approach entail? Well, I told you there's multiple lines of evidence. So aside the traditional morphological characterization and life cycle observation, we add DNA sequence data. And oftentimes uh, we do, uh, we focus on the 16S rRNA gene, or uh, we also do multi-locus phylogenies um, where we look at multiple genes when 16S rRNA is not informative alone. Uh, some people also look at P distances, um, but, what is a really, really cool um, new feature that we have been exploring is uh, reusing molecular synapomorphies in the molecular secondary structure of the 16S rRNA gene and the 16S 23S rRNA intergenic transcribed spacer. So here on, on the right, you can see a uh, hypothesized uh, model of, of the secondary structure of a nostoc 
and particularly we looking at specific regions such as the D1, D1 prime region, the uh, V2 region, if they have it, a box B or V3. Um, in addition to all this molecular information, we also use data on ecology and physiology. And most importantly, we in our lab apply the international code of nomenclature for algae, fungi, and plants. And so all these data and guidelines give us a great toolbox to describe new species in cyanobacteria, but also validate old species. And this gives me a great chance to advertise two important culture collections uh, here in the US that are really making a big impact to the inventorying, describing and monitoring of these keystone organisms. It's Jeff's collection at John Carroll University, so Jeffrey Johansson, and our collection here at New Mexico State University. And together they contain hundreds and hundreds of strains that are isolated primarily of ex from extreme environments with a focus on dryland habitats. And here's just a small collection of microscopy pictures showing off some of the beautiful organisms that we found. So on that note, I would like to use the remaining time to showcase exciting discoveries of soil cyanobacteria that are unique to dryland soils. And the first taxon I want to uh, present is Spirorestis raphaelensis, which is, the, is that first soil cyanobacteria genus that was described with a combination of morphological and molecular methods in 2002. It was discovered from well-crusted and totally undisturbed soils in a semi-arid juniper community in the San Rafael Swell that's in Utah. It's a rare taxon. Since 2002, it has only been detected in soils with well-established biocrusts in Utah, California, and Spain, using culture-dependent and independent approaches as shown here in a phylogenetic tree produced from a clone library made from Utah biocrust. Spirorestis is simply gorgeous and is so far the only distinctly spiraling species of soil cyanobacteria. It also develops a thick laminated protective sheath that helps to prevent rapid desiccation. What a beautiful organism, right? Another new lineage that I wanna talk about uh, next is a great example showcasing some of the challenges that we face while examining cyanobacterial taxonomy and describing cyanobacteria. There are many cases of taxonomic confusions that can be attributed to convergent evolution. So that happens when we use traits and um, identification that appear to indicate close evolutionary relationships, but later turn out not to be that way and um, represent traits that evolved multiple times due to similar environmental pressures, while the lineages end up being distantly related themselves. So a good example of such a trait is tapering, so the narrowing of one end of the filament. And in the past, there were two main genera, Anostocales, that were identified by tapering and the pre like by presence of heterocytes, but also by tapering. And those two genera were Calothrix and Rivularia. Both of them are found in aquatic environments, right? And Rivularia was the one with multiple trichomes originating from the center, while Calothrix uh, occurred more as a single trichome. Now, when um, researchers were doing 16S phylogenies in Nostocales um, and 
start adding molecular data of these these uh, two genera, what they saw was just the polyphyly of both genera. So uh, Kalos like showed up multiple places. So here we have a Bayesian phylogeny that's based on 16S with Kalothrix and Rivularia as our benchmarks. But there were also Kalothrix-like lineages that uh, people found from soil environments, but they were kind of distantly related. For example, Calochiti. Calochiti was uh, originally uh, confused with Calothrix because it's very similar to Calothrix being tapering and had heteropolar filaments. But it was also noticed that it did uh, something that was more like characteristic for tolipotric casey, which means um, they did single false branching, right? But um, Thomas Hauer, who worked on, on this uh, problem um, lineage, found that, uh, well, first, this lineage was distantly related to Kalothrix sensus stricto, so to the strict Kalothrix um, um, genus, but with closer observation then from, from this knowledge that it's distantly related, he started to observe uh, differences also in the life cycle. So he, he started to pick up tra on traits that were more similar or more familiar of, of taxa within Nosocasi, such as uh, the releasing of arthrospores in Sirius from the trichomant. So he ended up describing uh, this beautiful um, genus as Calochiti. And then Esther Berendero found this other lineage that came uh, or were discovered from Antarctic and Alpine soils, which kind of had a similar story. So she established this lineage as Macrochiti. And its unique feature is that really distal long highland hair, which uh, this genus expresses under low phosphorus condition. And lastly, we also discovered the lineage of uh, desert and temper temperate tapering cyanobacteria. We end up describing as Roholtiella. And Roholtiella is cool. Um, it has four, uh, currently four species with the type being described from temperate soils in Harrisburg, uh, Illinois, in the US. And what is interesting is that Roholtiella mohavensis is the species that comes from desert soils. And so far, it's reported only from undisturbed desert soils. Um, it's cool. It develops some really gorgeous heterocytes and very distinct arthrospores. And both of these uh, cell types are uh, just really specialized to help survival in the harsh environment and conditions that we experiencing here in dryland systems. Why they narrow at the one end is not known, but if I'm allowed to speculate, I would say it helps them anchor into the soil while they might grow upright. Another interesting genus is Mojavia. It has been found so far only in dryland biocrusted soils. This cyanobacterial genus is closely related to Nostoc and can be morphologically easily confused with its sister taxon. Mojavia develops some really distinct accessory sun sunscreen pigments that help protect itself from the intense desert UV radiation because it can be found at the very, very top of the soil surface. Now, Mojavia pulchra uh, is, or was described from biological soil crust in Joshua Tree National Park. 
which was for a long time its only record and species known. In recent years, um, it has been detected by next-gen sequencing approaches in Spain, as well as through isolation efforts from Atacama and Central Mojave Biocrest. And we're currently working on the description of two new species. And one of the unique and weird strain, uh, weird traits for this lineage is the development of monocytes. And uh, what the monocyte is, is like a single cell stage in the life cycle, which is very uh, unique um, and special for uh, a taxon within the Nastakesi. So not very common feature. All right, cool. So here's another really interesting taxon that has a very strange trait, Mixochorus. Mixochorus belongs into the family Leptolingbiaceae in the order Synecocales. And it has um, two species that come from dryland soils, Mixochorus chilensis and Mixochorus californica. And both species um, uh, develop this slime cap at the apical cell which is made of really soft exopolysaccharides. And we have no idea why they make this cap for. The next example is Kostovsky adunga, which to date has been only reported in Atacama desert soils in South America. It's one of the lineages that was previously morphologically um, corresponding to Microcoleus the instrupii, a taxon historically, a taxon that historically produced an enormous amount of taxonomic confusion. Many taxa in the order oscillatories fit the morphological description of Microcoleus the instrupii, but when genetic information is compared, those lineages are distantly related, producing that polyphyly that I, talked to you before, right? And so we have a polyphyly of microcholestein strupi-like um, taxa as shown here with many crimson boxes in the phylogenetic tree. But thanks to Rapka's work, we started to deconvolute this taxonomic mass by describing um, one of these clades. And Kostovskia does not only awaken taxonomic curiosities, but also could become important to biotech as it turns out to be a phenomenal exopolysaccharide producer, a property highly sought after in soil restoration. Since then, there has been additional work on resolving more clades. For example, a study by Petrasia et al established the DNA-based phylogenetic benchmark for its simple castrum and confirms its placement in the form of the AC. And last year, several new genera were described from biological soil crust in the Brazilian Cadinca biome. Last but not least, I wanted to showcase another new genus in Leptolin BAC that was previously thought to belong to another taxonomic confusing genus, Leptolingbia. So here's Crocolemma. Currently, it has three species, and two of those were described from Chihuahuan desert soils in Mexico. Its unique trait is that it develops some really dark, darkly colored sheath made of firm exopolysaccharides, which contain a potentially new cyanobacterial pigment that may chemically differ from all known cyanobacterial accessory pigments. Really cool, right? Well, there are many more interesting dryland soil cyanos out there, but unfortunately, I don't have time to showcase them all together unless we wanna be here till midnight. Um, and I have to say on top of that, we're really only in the beginning of the discovery phase. And there's so much more diversity out there in our drylands that is just waiting to be discovered. But what is really exciting is when we see our newly described or revised 
tax are showing up in biodiversity surveys with next-gen sequencing technology. You have to realize that most of the dryland cyanobacteria are microscopic, so microalgae that require old-fashioned isolation and culture-based techniques to study their life history and gain genomic information. So with such an artificial approach, we don't really know how prevalent these taxa are in the environment. But the more taxonomy is happening, the more frequently new taxa seem to appear in culture-independent surveys. Also, our taxonomic work really improves um, sequence classification. As a result, we'll obtain greater ecological information. So here's an example of four locations that we're working at in the Chihuahuan Desert and on uh, showcasing different biocrust types. And without jumping in too much detail on the data, I just highlighted all the taxa that we would not have been able to detect or identify without recent taxonomic work. So as you can see, the fruits of our taxonomic labor are highly relevant for biodiversity surveys and help to start disentangling the niche requirements for our blue-green friends. All right, so I hope I could convince you that discovering dryland cyanobacteria is cool and that this work matters. Um, really, drylands are a taxonomic treasure chest Yet we face a, a ginormous need uh, for taxonomic expertise, right? And so therefore it's critical that we need to increase the support for taxonomic research um, because then we can do a much better job in linking our taxonomic expertise to molecular sequence uh, data which will then help to understand the distribution, population limits, and dispersal mechanisms of uh, cyanobacteria. And, um, you know, like what is exciting is that in dryland cyanobacteria um, diversity research is that we, we did enter a new era of, of taxonomy because we made such great advances in molecular biology and microscopy. And so, you know, there's a lot of change happening and we're finding that a lot of old established uh, taxa are polyphyletic and in need of revision. And uh, a lot of that confusion is due to things like convergent uh, evolution and having not a lot of characters to go by to begin with. However, when we connect it to our drylands, um, we, we get evidence every day that our drylands har harbor a great potential of discovering new taxa designs. Uh, while facing a, an incredible numbers of uh, threats. So uh, in terms of future direction uh, for, for our lab and, and in general, you know, we, we need to continue working on um, getting our reference sequence, reference sequence databases improved. So then, um, you know, we, we get a better knowledge of, of like who's out there, um, what our cyanobacteria diversity is like by including um, taxa from strange environments, from extreme environments such as dryland systems, just to, to broaden um, uh, that diversity or the knowledge of that diversity. And uh, as always, there are many, many, many unique lineages that we need to work on. And so I am just repeating myself, we, we just need um, taxonomists to work on them. And that requires academic and governmental support. And with that, I would like to acknowledge Team Dryland Algae, my numerous soil algae and cyanobacterial friends and colleagues, 
which supported my past efforts advocating for these organisms. And of course, my funding sources and the people behind it who always had an open ear and eye to value dryland soils as a precious resource. Thank you for your attention.